Hello, this is Sart for an LSN tap. We're going to get started here in about a minute and a half. We've still got people logging on here. Um, so we'll get started at about two minutes after. Um, two quick things. Uh, one of those is we've got a new LSN tap website, uh, which is up. We're going through a um, Feature improvement, we're going to be working with Urban Insight to add some features to the DLaw template. If there's anything you would like to see improved about the website, let us know. As with all of our trainings, this training is going to be recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, we are uh, just dropped into the chat there a link to our YouTube channel. We've got over 200 uh, legal services videos. And so please um, check some of those out. Let us know what you think. And if there's anything that you want to see for an upcoming webinar, um, we are about to do our uh, webinar schedule for the entire rest of the year. So we are very open to any suggestions. We've got a survey, and I will be dropping a link to that survey into the, uh, into the chat here. And I'll just pull it up really quickly right before we start. Um, the link is coming here in just one second. I accidentally closed the window down that I had the extra link in. Um, super happy to have our presenters here today. And there is there was a five-minute version of this talk that was given at the Legal Services Conference um, a few months, or last month, just barely last month. Um, we are talking to LSC and maybe adding that mini version also up onto our website as another way to promote this stuff. Um, but I'm turning it over at this point to Laura Quinn. Thank you so much for coming out here and doing this presentation. There's always challenges in figuring out what is really the return on investment and what type of impact uh, projects have. And this is a very uh, creative and interesting way to look at that. So thank you, Laura. Great, thanks so much for, for having me. So yeah, absolutely. We are going to be talking through what we're calling the Drake Equation for Access to Justice. Um, so this has been a project with a bunch of partners. Um, and in fact, you can see even more logos in just a second. Um, it's been spearheaded by the Florida Justice Technology Center, of which I have been the director of data. Um, it's been, had some, had, had some funding support by LSC. Um, IELTS at the University of Colorado has given a little bit of funding. And uh, obviously, LSN Cap is supporting us today. Um, so what is this thing? A second as I figure out how to advance my slides. So we will, this diagram is a diagram we'll spend a lot of time looking at. Um, but in general, the idea of the equation or a, a kind of a framework is that, or a model I'll also call it, is that it allows us to think through quantitatively access to justice projects even when we don't have all the data. So it's actually specifically designed to kind of hold placeholders or guesstimates for things that we may not have complete data for, which is an awful lot in this space. So we'll come back to this diagram and talk a lot about it. Um, and there's, the process of designing this has been a careful one over the course of about a year. Um, so it's been in partnership with a bunch of research partners with uh, on the ground legal aid organizations, and more. Um, so lots of partners. It's based on a original Drake equation, um, which was created in the 1950s for an entirely different purpose. It's named after this guy, Drake, Frank Drake. Um, and it's, it was intended to, or designed to, uh, be a kind of a thought experiment to look at, I don't know why my slides keep advancing, um, to look at the number of civilizations that we can communicate with. So basically, as, uh, as part of a uh, hunt for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's just a string of numbers multiplied by each other. So the number of civilizations we can communicate with is equal to this number times this number times this number times this number, et cetera. There are seven factors. 
Um, and some of these factors are really very knowable by science. So it starts with the number of stars that are created per year. And that's actually a number that science has a pretty good handle on right now. Um, the next one in is the fraction of those stars that have planets. All right, kind of out of my control, apparently. It just happened. Uh, the fraction of those stars that have planets. Um, so, um, uh, which is also pretty, pretty knowable. This is generally thought to be about two uh, per, um, oh, sorry, that, that was uh, planet per star. I don't know what this one is off the top of our head, top of my head, but it's, it's known. Um, others of these get very metaphysical, get very difficult to estimate. So the fraction of the planets where life develops, all we have right now is we've got a sample size of one. We only know that, in fact, well, we've got a couple of planets around the, uh, around the sun, so we have those to look at. This is literally going by itself. Oh, it's because of the rapid fire. Oh, okay, we'll get out of this soon. Um, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to take the timing off. Um, so, um, uh, and so in things, some of this gets extremely um, metaphysical. So what's the average number of years an alien civilization sends signals into space? Like, how would we even begin to estimate this? Um, but it's been really useful for more than 50 years. It's helped people to guide conversations, it's focused research and more. Basically, it puts, it puts a framework around, if we knew all of these things, we would know the answer. So the idea of the applying this to access to justice has been to find a, a method by which we could take this approach to say, all right, if we knew these things, then we would know the impact of these projects. And so here it, here it is. Here's what we've come up with. So it's kind of a, so it is also just a series of numbers multiplied together. Um, so in this case, they kind of serve as a funnel. Um, so you've got the number of people targeted um, by your project at the top, people who are able to use it. I'll let it. I'll just let it step through because it's going to step through all of these. Um, the number of people who found it. Um, so basically, the number of people who are able to find your site and uh, were able to, in fact, do something with it, uh, which is underneath it, the received benefits. And the ones up front um, are generally the idea that you are, that you could probably define before you start your project. So you've targeted it, you, you know how many people you've targeted, you can calculate how many can use it. Um, as you go through, you're going to find that you're going to need to bake them in to the project. So how many found it, how many received benefits. And then at the bottom of the pyramid, whether it had a positive impact or not, or an outcome, is going to often require specific proactive research, or it might just be some guesswork right now um, for, for us to come back around to as a sector down the road. There's also this idea of financial impact. Um, so in fact, if you thought of that, I'm going to give you specific examples of all of these things. Um, so once you think through the number of people who received benefit from your tool, then it's actually a fairly straightforward um, step to say, OK, and what was the financial impact of each of those people served so we can actually come to the potential dollar impact of either savings to the sector, so your savings to legal aid, savings to the actual person who needs the help, um, other things like that, savings from healthcare. All right, so and all of these things are we, so we use numbers where we have them, we use hard data where hard data exists, but in cases where we don't have hard data, we use proxies. So we use places where we say, all right, well, this isn't exactly the same, but I'm going to uh, say it's 
similar enough to use. Um, so for instance, um, uh, to say, all right, well, we don't know exactly how many people are, are faced with conditions, issues, and is, is, issues in their rental housing, but we suspect that it's going to be similar in number to, let's say, the number of people who are living, who are, have a rent burden of 200% something like that so basically we say all right this isn't exactly the same but we we're going to base it on something or uh we can just make a plausible guess so we can say all right well i don't actually know this number but i'm going to guess um and it basically then it becomes a thought exercise to say all right what's plausible what's the plausible impact of this all right, let's look at, we're gonna look at a couple examples. I'm gonna walk you through, um, uh, so at the same time, I'm gonna walk you through this example. I'm gonna walk you through a fictitious example um, of a kind of modeled on a statewide website. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the worksheet that, um, that we've developed that will help. <laughs> I'm not gonna move away from these slides because they're gonna be done. Um, I'm going to walk you through a worksheet that we've developed to help you think it through yourself. So any questions about kind of the whole idea at a high level before I start diving into kind of how this idea is applied? So any questions into the chat? I love questions. Otherwise, I'm just standing here in my office by myself talking to myself. Start. I'm not sure I'm e able to easily see the questions. So, if you can, so uh, just to remind people, there are two ways to submit questions. One of those is to use the question box um, that is on the control panel. Um, I'm monitoring that and can read those out. The other one is to use the raise your hand function. Um, if you do that, we can unmute you and you can ask questions uh, that way. But we're given kind of the size of the audience, we're willing to have a conversation over the this if anybody has questions. We don't have any at this point yet, though. Absolutely. Great. All right. Um, so our first example, we're going to be walking through actual an actual model for the Florida Name Change website. Um, so this is an actual website created by Florida to help folks update their um, uh, their name and their gender marker. Um, so it's specifically targeted at the transgender community for whom it's often a big barrier that they've transitioned their physical appearance. So for instance, they've gone from male to female in physical appearance, um, but they still have an ID that has a name which is incongruous and a gender marker. Um, so it says they're female instead of male. I think it was vice versa with my example, male instead of female. Um, and that can just lead to lots of discrimination and just difficult times, harassment. So let's let's start by looking at the uh, the top of the funnel. So looking at the uh, the first couple of steps um, for Florida name change. So looking at the number of people targeted and for how many of those folks is the site accessible? So for Florida name change, um, we started with the number of adults who identify as transgender in Florida. Um, and we have we actually have a couple of really great reports which made this a particularly great example. So this is actually a, I'm gonna show you uh, another example where the data isn't nearly as good, which is a probably more typical example. Um, so, but here is an actual number from the Williams Institute um, as from adults who uh, identify as transgender in Florida. Um, so we then need to think about how many of those folks who are transgender have actually um, have made a appearance transition um, from one gender to another. Um, so not all of them have. 25% um, is uh, what is estimated um, or what's been reported by this other report, which is, uh, which is actually a fantastic source of information for the whole thing. And then we need to think about how many of the folks who have transitioned their parents actually wants to change their driver's license or their state ID. Um, and this is the number of people who, who expressed that, um, uh, that, that desire. 
one of the things that we need to think about as we look at this stuff is whether how related these two things are. Like, for instance, we've just put both of these things and we've said, OK, of the 25 percent who identify as transgender, only 58 percent of them um, want to actually change their driver's license. Um, if these actually are going to overlap a lot, then we might need to think more about that. So if, for instance, half the people, so almost all of the people who want to change their driver's license um, uh, have, in fact, transitioned their gender, then that's going to affect our bottom line. Let me show you a different example. So this is Springfield Legal Help. So this is a fictitious example. Um, it's based on the model of, well, I, I guess this would be a, not a statewide website, but a city website, legal website. Um, so um, looking to uh, provide kind of core legal info for uh, low and low and middle income people. Um, so here we're looking at the number of people targeted. And we might, might say, OK, well, we want to look at the number of people in Springfield who are below 300% of poverty. So here's our core number. And then we're going to factor that down to say, well, not everybody who lives in poverty has necessarily a civil legal question. Um, so let's say 40%. Um, this is based on a model we're still working on from Florida, and we're still pinning down our source for that. Um, and then this actually came up for us. This might not be the same for every um, website like this, but it became important to us to try to define, um, to say, OK, we're not trying to answer all of those questions with pro se materials. We feel that some of these civil legal questions are really only answerable by a lawyer, and we're not going to try to take them on. So that was 60% that by a careful estimate it kind of was the target, we will say in this fictional example, fictitious example for this item. So that leaves us a number in our target audience. Let me just show you how this plays out in this magical worksheet that we've created for you. Actually, I'm going to show you this first and then we can show how it moves down. So this is a worksheet that's designed to calculate through and has just a ton of instructional text. Um, the reason that it's stamped with draft all over it um, is that it is really we need to get it out in the field and people working with it um, in order to see how well it works. Like, for instance, this, I'm worried that this may be a overwhelming amount of instructional text and examples. There's more examples here. Um, but um, possibly more is better than less with something that's, that's somewhat complicated. So, so the way this works is basically you would start with um, the number of people or households in your geographic area. It's probably going to be your typical starting point. Um, it's likely going to be from census data. And then you're going to think through your limiting factors. And your limiting factors are what we just looked at for um, these other examples. So this would be, you know, what percentage of them have changed their physical appearance um, um, if you're looking at transgender. Um, what percentage of them actually have a civil legal question? What percentage of them are living in poverty? Um, and you might have more than one limiting factor. Um, so you're writing them in, and you're putting your data in your data source. Um, when you write it in, um, so we're going to say there's 1,000 people in our target audience, and this one's 45, and this one's 67, and this one's 89, uh, it's going to automatically calculate for you. Um, and then this calculation automatically populates this summary tab, which um, goes with the diagram. So basically, we've got number targeted, which is all we've talked about so far, is the top level in our diagram. And here we've got number targeted. And this is um, calculated out for your project. 
All right. Give me questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I am going to move on and I'm going to talk about some examples for uh, percent accessible. All right. So the next level is thinking about how many of the people we've targeted can actually get access to this information. Um, and it's a little wiggly as to which of these are in which, uh, so whether the, you know, like for instance, are we targeting only English speakers? And so we're going to take them out here. Or are we going to say, well, really our ambition is to support everybody in the city of Springfield or all transgender people in Florida. And thus we're going to take them out here. Um, so we need to acknowledge somewhere that people who don't speak English can't use our tool or people who can't read English can't use our tool because it's, you know, written information and it's in English. Um, but it's kind of a matter of, uh, so you could say that's not our intent for the tool. We don't intend to support Spanish speakers. Uh, in this particular case for Florida name change, uh, that would be a little uncomfortable. It would imply that we only care about English speaking transgender folks and not Spanish speaking transgender folks, which I don't know why that would be our strategy. Um, so, um, so in this case, we've in fact not said that. Um, so basically, um, this is the percent of the population that can this is actually read. Sorry, I messed with this a little bit. Uh, Brandon, this is not our live model. <laughs> so, um, so this is the percent of the population that can read the language that's are included. It's important to for any written thing to include literacy. We've been kind of blown away as we were looking at this. How, and in fact, I have it on the next one. How low literacy rates are um, for a lot of ways that you might measure them. Um, and how many people are able to use written information on the internet? Oh, actually, here's what we did here. So we have how many people can speak the language, and this was actually up at 90%, something like that. And we basically said how many people are able to use written information, including through help, uh, through sources of help. So for instance, somebody who uh, is transgender and wants to change their gender marker how many of them can find somebody to help them use this tool? Um, and this is a guess. It strikes me it might be kind of high by that definition. Um, but basically, we're uh, we're taking a combination of, as you can see, data from like the census survey and um, kind of some some things that are really hard to know. We actually did a deep dive for a different estimation project on trying to actually estimate how many people had access to the internet and it is surprisingly difficult. <laughs> so so we, we kind of punted with had access to the internet or could find help to do so. Um, and that means um, the that together 88% of the folks that we in our target audience can actually get access uh, coming out to 12,000. Springfield Legal Help. So what percentage can read English at a basic level or above? Um, this is definitely take a look at this for yourself. Things get really kind of alarming when you're uh, when you're looking at uh, people, like wh what you define as basic, what you define as um, being able to read. Um, so basic is about a, I think we looked at it, there's not a good definition, but this was about a fourth or a fifth grade level, um, we felt. Um, what percentage of the audience can get info online or can get help to do so? So this is our 95% number. Um, so then we can't just multiply these numbers by each other because we have to assume that a lot of the people who can't get online are a lot of the same people who can't read English at a basic level. Um, so they're, they're not going to be completely multiplicative. So basically, <laughs> you've got the very technical term, 
here's an eyeball mashup of the above stats. Um, so basically, this is a saying, all right, it's close, but not quite to multiply together. And then here's another really important one to think through for content sites. So, uh, so we have, you know, there's a lot of people in Springfield. They've got lots of uh, civil legal questions. Of all of those questions, what percentage does our site actually answer? And for almost all of our content website, the answer is probably, you know, not a vast majority. You know, like there's always a lot more questions that one can ask. Um, so it's useful to estimate, okay, so by volume of number of people asking, what percentage have we done? And this 30% would imply that in Springfield, we're kind of just starting out here. Um, so we're, we haven't gotten very far through the things uh, that we think we'd like to get to eventually. And this has, this means that if you take these numbers, so the number of people who can read that, read it, and the number of people who um, can use it to answer their specific questions, this is, is, results in a remarkably low number. And this is kind of a useful, you know, this is one of the places where we can start to see the value of doing a mental exercise like this, even if we're guessing some of these numbers. Because, wow, if only 30% or only 20 sorry, 19% of our target audience can use it, should be, we be thinking of doing other things? Like what could we do? Like a, like maybe a Spanish level, a Spanish version of it, maybe adding videos to the site to target people who aren't um, uh, literate for written things, uh, maybe adding more, more legal content. Um, so we can start to think of that. Um, so here's our, um, our total number of people who can use it. I'm just applying this to our worksheet. <laughs> Sorry, I lost it for a second here. Did <laughs> my number able to use it? I had a, had a moment of fear when I thought it wasn't in here. Um, so this tends to be relatively straightforward, we found, across projects. So we've just dumped um, the key things um, that we have found to be useful. So what percentage of the population can speak the language that are included? Um, what percentage of the population can read and access the internet? Uh, what percentage of your target audience is likely to want to know Want to, is likely to want or know to do about your topic. So basically, what is the content that is available to address your target audience need? And if you fill out those numbers, they will populate, oh, let's do some, because it'll populate not just, let's say 90%, 40%. Um, so it will, um, okay, so I need to prove this, <laughs> sorry, um, so it will um, populate something which is not the um, uh, 0.3 people who are able to use it. Um, but it'll give you both the number and the percentage. Um, these might be backwards. Yeah, there's a backward. Um, so it's 94 people in our target day, and we started with only 1,000 people. 94 people to whom the site is accessible, and 35%. Um, that's 35% of the target audience. All right. Powering onward, unless people have questions. Um, number of people who found it might be actually the, the most straightforward level here. Um, so this is simply like it sounds, how many people actually went there at all. And given if we're saying that this is specifically online tools, online tools, it's generally fairly easy to measure uh, who came. Um, through something like Google Analytics, 
uh, we've got something uh, or unique visitors is generally a good number. Um, we need to figure out how many of those folks are actually in our target audience. Um, and depending on who your target audience is, that may be straightforward. So if we were targeting everybody in Springfield, that would be easier. Um, because we're targeting people who are below 300% poverty, uh, we need to actually uh, ballpark um, how many of these folks are actually 300% um, um, uh, below poverty. Um, so, and in this case, um, uh, we use we uh, benchmark a couple of other sites um, to see what would make sense. Um, so, like for instance, in Illinois, 90% of the people who use the Illinois Guided Help are below 300% poverty. 80% um, are below 100% of poverty who use the Massachusetts Guided Help. So, that, that given those statistics, <coughs> it felt like 65% was a pretty conservative estimate. And basically, when you're doing ballparking like this, we've very much um, kind of defaulted to, well, we're not really very sure, so therefore, let's default to something more conservative. Um, and then it's, it's more defendable at the end when you say, all right, it's this many people impacted, it's this amount of financial impact. You can kind of say, well, given these extremely reasonable guesses, um, this is kind of the minimum impact that we're having. Here's the percents that are actually from, so let's say it's Springfield County, from <laughs> Google Analytics. Uh, Google Analytics is kind of a pain to get out city data. Um, in fact, you really can't, you'd have to prorate it. Um, which I could say more, but I won't. Um, so basically, just know that although you're not nuts in thinking you can't get out city level data from Google Analytics or zip code level data. Um, so, um, and then thinking about um, a potentially the number of page views um, who, who found this, um, this particular site. So this has, um, just people, the page views is not actually in this calculation. So this is the number of people who found it. And then we can go ahead and look at things like the percent of those accessible who found it. So, which is kind of an interesting statistic. So of all of those folks who could use the site, how many used it? In fact, what we find is that a lot, you know, a third of all people who could use this site have used this site. And thinking about it in this way actually gets to be fairly interesting because taking out, like for instance, the accessibility uh, issue is really helpful because you could also, if you just look at this and say, well, what percentage of all of the people we targeted have actually come? Well, that's only 5%. And that looks a lot, well, I mean, it looks a lot worse. But in fact, well, I don't know if it's worse or better. In fact, we've done it to ourselves <laughs> by not making it actually usable um, by the people, and not usable for at least what they're hoping to use it for by the people that we're looking to serve. Um, let's look at Florida name change. Um, number of people found it. Uh, this, so it's a very similar concept. So the number of unique visitors from Florida, we just went ahead and glommed those into one line. Um, we need to then try to limit it to transgender folks, um, which we don't have. We don't actually ask folks whether they're transgender. Um, so there's no easy way to know that. Um, so what we did is we looked at the percentage of those assemble at least one form that includes a change in gender marker. Um, so this is actually going to be a very low statistic because you could imagine that there's some folks who are kind of just going through the first step and they're changing their name, uh, but not their gender marker yet, um, who are actually transgender. Um, but so we have a low estimate of the number of folks on our site who are transgender. 
Um, and this is, um, so comes out to about 23%, 24% of our target audience. Um, so this is actually a slightly different statistic. This is actually of the target audience, as opposed to those of whom it's accessible, I think. Yes. Um, who have actually visited the site. Both are pretty useful uh, statistics, but I think I put them both on the worksheet. Um, so basically, uh, in fact, a quarter of all people um, who we are targeting have visited the site, which is pretty impressive, and there's been a crap load of uh, promotion around this tool in a pretty uh, tight and connected community in Florida. Um, so it's, I think that this is a reasonable number that we've actually hit that many. All right, and in the worksheet. So we're going through tabs here. So there's one tar a tab for targeted and then also the able to use benefit, and, sorry, able to use level. Then another one for found it um, and the actual benefits. Um, so I'm going to go through this, and then just to have a little bit of a change of pace, I'm going to I'm going to put Brandon on the spot, and I'm going to ask him um, just kind of anything that he's found to be particularly interesting as he's kind of gone through this exercise, thinking about it specifically for Florida um, in this found it level. Um, kind of anything to add. So I'm going to go through the spreadsheet first, um, Brandon. So you can have a minute, put your thoughts in order. Um, so. Um, this is um, a, probably a fairly um, straightforward, well, not necessarily straightforward to know, but at least straightforward to think about what the numbers are. So this is an easy one, probably. The number of unique visitors is likely from Google Analytics. The number of people specific to your geographic area. Um, so thinking through how you move from uh, everyone to your geographic area. And then thinking through what percentage of this traffic is from your target audience. Um, this could be a guess. Um, so if we weren't doing document assembly, um, but we're targeting transgender folks, it would be pretty darn difficult to know um, whether folks were transgender or not. Um, so we would try to have to, we would have to do some kind of um, guess as to um, how many of those were. All right, so if we say we've got, uh, actually remember my numbers, keep them separate. So let's say we've got 300 people and 250 are specific to our geographic area and 90% are from our um, target audience. 225 of them found it, then this populates my diagram. So here's my number who found it and in fact, this is not <laughs> this is embarrassing. I will go through and fix the worksheet before we disseminate the worksheet. I thought I had tested it really well, but apparently I'm not. Um, so and I might actually do two um, uh, two numbers here. So the percent of targeted who found it and the percent accessible found it. Because I think both of them are used are useful. All right, um, Brandon, so having been through this exercise for a couple of slides, any tips on kind of where we've, uh, the levels we've been through so far? Um, honestly, um, well, first of all, I'll say it definitely is, it's a very uh, amazing framework. Um, if you guys kind of get a chance to work through it, Laura's done an amazing job of actually putting this all together, a lot of thought to it. Um, I don't know. It was, it was kind of interesting um, thinking about the funnel. There's just there's just a lot of things that I think are more eye opening about it than anything. Um, a lot of the things we've been you know struggling with when we've been doing our models as far as the readability statistics, you know, how many people can read the basic levels and things like that. And I think by going through the process of thinking through this, you really do see where some of the the, the pitfalls are. And you and you understand that there are some things that may not you know work as well for your users as you think they are. So I, I think that that's one of the things that's been very eye opening to me. And then um, the other thing is as we've kind of been doing like a lot of the impact, trying to figure out the dollar impact of a lot of our tools. You know, we found that there probably are you know ways that we can work you know better as a community. 
to kind of think through, you know, how do we value like a lawyer's time or something like that on these type of cases, or how do we value, you know, the type type or the amount of legal aid that we're providing to people. So I think there's a lot of interesting questions, you know, on the impact side that, you know, as a community, and I'll, I'll kind of just to give, I guess, a little quick plug, Laura, we'll talk about it later too, but we're thinking about having an ongoing group, you know, for the Drake Equation that as a community, we can think through a lot of these things and kind of help each other come up with better, you know, better reasonable estimates for the these type of, you know, uh, figures as we're kind of work, working through them. And I mean, that was kind of my over my overall thoughts. I mean, if you work with it, it is really eye opening. There's a lot of things you'll see that you probably weren't expecting and it can really help you understand your site, you know, and your visitors and how you can, you know, serve them better. Fantastic. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, and in yeah. fact, I didn't introduce Brandon very well. That's um, okay. is the, um, uh, the new director of data and actually several other things um, at uh, Florida Justice Technology Center, who's been working with me and uh, applying this to uh, Florida stuff. So, um, great. So let us um, continue to delve down the funnel here. Um, so, We've got then the number of folks who took action. Uh, actually, this has changed names. This is the number who I think it's received benefits. Received benefits. Um, so this is gets this is where we start to get a little more interesting um, than simply the number of people who came to the site. But we don't yet have to worry too much about, all right, has it changed their life or not, um, which is down in the positive outcomes. Um, so I think it's useful, very useful to separate the two, because I think we can often get ourselves really wrapped around the difference between, for instance, um, outputs and outcomes, for those of you who are familiar with that model, or whether something is really a significant enough benefit to count. So basically, this model says you can essentially you can count anything you want, um, and the worksheet allows you infinite columns to count whatever benefits you think are useful. Um, so here are the things that we've. Um, uh, so in fact, for the um, uh, the content website, we kind of work through a model which just gets to one benefit, and you could have multiple. Um, but this is, it has just one, which is you're trying to go, get through how many people understood their options after reading this page. And so that's obviously not a incredibly easy thing to know. We stepped through a couple of different things to try to get something that we felt was plausible. So, well, something that we know is that not all, con all visits to the site are visits to a content page. Um, so logically, they're not understanding their options if all they've used is the home page. Um, so we can leave those out. Um, we have scroll data on the site. So we can say, all right, who did any scrolling at all on this page? Uh, and this is a proxy figure. Um, so it's possible that someone completely understood their options without scrolling down the page. But it's certainly just as likely or more likely. Um, that people scroll down the page without understanding any options. <laughs> so this is a, we basically use this as a proxy to actually, um, uh, to basically pay someone who engaged with the page, who actually looked for information. And then, then there's people, how many of those folks who actually looked for information actually read enough for, or read enough of the page to actually get their answer? Uh, this is a guess. Um, we are, there is data coming out of Ohio fairly soon. We actually have just done a, um, a randomized controlled trial to try to get some numbers around, you know, to what extent do, do in fact, does giving people information actually help them to understand options and encourage them to take action? Um, so there'll be more soon here. Um, but then coming down to the percent that understood their options after reading the page. And so if you multiply all of these together, this comes to 13% of those who found the site um, were able to understand their options for their question. And a lot of this is, is simply guesswork. 
Um, the, one of the, the ideas of the Drake equation is, well, so a couple things. Number one is that a guess is better than just kind of saying, throwing up our hands and having no, nothing at all to estimate with. Number two is, with, is that if we get together as a community to have uh, similar guesses <laughs> across the community, at least we'd be uh, baselining based on the same thing. And then that would also, number three, allow us to do research to allow us to improve those guesses over time, uh, which is something that the original Drake equation for extraterrestrial life has really proven to be good for. So looking at these numbers, although we might look at them and say, well, this is, I mean, I, this is nothing but guessing, these are, this is stuff that is researchable um, and we could get to eventually. Um, so here's what this looks like. So this is, uh, what did I write with this? Received benefit. Um, so um, this is, a, because of the document assembly site, um, this actually becomes very straightforward um, for um, uh, name change. Um, so basically, the uh, we, because there are a bunch of people filling out multiple documents, um, we, we just pulled a single one that is the most filled out um, with a gender marker as the proxy for how many people are doing things. So this is a low number for how many people are doing things, because some people might not do the social security card. Um, and then the number of actions. We were interested in just looking at the funnel here of um, how many people actually completed it. So we looked at that. So here is the number of people who completed. Oh, sorry, this is the number of people who viewed it, and here's the number of people who completed it. Um, so then we've just pulled down the number of people who completed it as our, um, our benefit. And we can then, again, we can look at this as a percent of target visitors. So 7.1% um, of people who came to the site uh, received a benefit, as we've defined the benefit. And here it is in the worksheet. So this is essentially, there's not much to put in, a, in this spreadsheet. Um, because the benefits are really going to vary by project. Um, so, uh, so you're going to have to think through what measurable things uh, you want to define as benefits um, in order to put in this spreadsheet. So if we actually, so these, these just some, so 32, so 10 people received this benefit, 15 people received this benefit, 57 people received benefit. This is plugged in here. All right, outcomes. Um, well, I'll start on this one because it's most tactical to be able to see it, but it's, it's almost unfair uh, because there is a fantastic report that allowed us to have data that we could actually use here. Um, there is a report that actually estimates, uh, or it has how many people, how many transgender folks have reported being harassed or worse um, based on having an ID that doesn't match their, um, their, their physical gender appearance. Um, and so we have uh, statistics for this. So 32% of transgender folks have been, uh, been harassed or denied service or attacked. 9%, uh, so more specifically, denied service or have to leave. 2% have been attacked. Uh, and so we can calculate this through and say, all right, here is the number of people who were uh, just spared harassment. So this is a total number. And then we have more specific number, including you know, a pretty powerful four people who were spared attack based on this. I'm going to go all the way through to the um, uh, the financial impact um, on on this because um, it's they're they're pretty related. Um, you could look at a number of different things um, to measure a financial impact. Like you could, for instance, uh, estimate the 
uh, amount of time that it would take uh, someone to do this pro se and the and put that at minimum wage or something like that. Um, in our case, um, lawyer hours is for uh, pro bono attorneys, or sorry, for legal aid attorneys, is kind of an easy thing to to use. Um, so we have we've estimated that it takes um, uh, 1.75 hours um, to do this whole process to fill out all the forms needed. Um, and so if we say that it's, so if we say the one rate of a legal aid attorney, not what they actually would bill, but what they're actually costing the legal aid sector is $90 an hour, here's the savings in money um, that's been produced. All right, so positive outcome for our Springfield Legal Health this gets super wiggly. Um, so very, let's put a finger in the air and guess something. Um, so how many, so we've said, all right, here are the number of people who actually understand their option. How many people have done something or correctly not done something um, that has made a positive change in their life compared to having no information available? So this is, a Probably one could go down a rabbit hole into like behavioral science and find out how many people are likely to take action based on having information. Um, I have not done that. We haven't done that yet. Um, and so this is just a, you know, kind of a uh, out of out of nowhere guess. Um, but it's presumably, you know, it's probably going to be at least a few percentage points. It's definitely not going to be 90 percent. Um, and so we hopefully as a community can get closer and closer to that. So here's then a plausible number for whom Springfield Legal Health is, has helped move in an actual productive life direction, which is not an impressively high figure right now. <laughs> so this is not necessarily that we at Springfield Legal Health, which doesn't exist, um, would want to share with a funder in exactly this form. Um, but one of the things that you could do with it is you could say, all right, well, how much, for instance, is like, we can use it as a model to say, all right, well, if we said that 90% of our target audience could actually use this information, how much does that change it? Oh, it doesn't because they're not coming. Um, so we'd have to figure out, we then have to model how many more people do we, and we'd actually want to change this. Um, the, to say, all right, how many, um, uh, how many people are finding it uh, because it's now accessible to them? Um, so yes, you can use it in that way. Um, and here we have, so we could say, for instance, if they understood information, it was equivalent to talking to an attorney for, let's say, half an hour, because attorneys don't talk for less than half an hour. Um, so, and for no reason, we used a different number here. So we can say, all right, so our run rate is $90. Um, and that um, equates to about $50,000 of value. Um, so, and in and fact, this is a much more impressive number than this. I mean, neither are going to probably support the program um, unless, you know, you make a big case for why it's, um, doing really important stuff in other ways or how you're improving it year over year. Um, but basically, um, it's because this assumes that many of the folks who talk to a lawyer also did not make a positive change in their life, uh, which is probably true. Um, so basically, this is the financial value of having saved that lawyer's time. Um, great, I'm playing that out in the worksheets. Um, this actually, this worksheet looks a little different um, to try to allow you to have a bunch of other, uh, to have a bunch of outcomes if you want. Um, so basically the idea here is that I'm going to take the benefits, so think, stuff from here, people who received benefits, I'm going to write in the benefit and then I'm also going to write in the benefit here. So. Sorry, my draft is on top of everything. 
So my benefit might be um, uh, created a name change form. And then I'm going to just fill in, uh, uh, this is already filled in. It's pulled over from the other sheet for me, the people who did uh, benefit number two. Um, so um, we then have, we then estimate, okay, so we say, what is the outcome that we think uh, is happening? So basically, for this example that I'm walking through here, um, so I'm uh, doing name change, this might be uh, saved harassment. Um, and we say that, whatever that number was, 29%, uh, was saved from harassment. Um, and then this is how many people um, that actually was. Um, and then you could do something else, um, saved um, from attack. So four people, and that is a fraction of a person. Um, uh, and you can do the same. So this is the model here. Uh, primarily works with the assumption that you're saving somebody hours, which is not the only thing that you could financially estimate, but is a good guess. Um, it's probably a place for a lot of people to start, um, so you can go through there. Um, and this worksheet throughout has has example cases that follow throughout. This last tab simply has these um, example cases filled out uh, for your reference. Okay, a few last closing thoughts, um, and I would love to um, take questions, thoughts, um, uh, anything you have uh, to close. So we would love um, any or all of you to um, apply this to whatever makes sense to you. This is all free to use, to do whatever you want with, to modify, to whatever. Um, so we have the recording, um, so we'll have a recording of this, we have a recording of the, um, the five minute um, uh, speed talk I gave at TIG, uh, the worksheet, which I'll now update, so it's actually correct, uh, will all be um, at this uh, URL online, which I think uh, Sartre will now also put into the chat. Um, think about not only the obvious application for evaluating your projects, but think of it as, think of it potentially for comparing projects to each other, uh, to create baselines, uh, to think through, like before you start a project, to look at a bunch of other people who have done projects like it to understand what this looks like for them, which would help you under understand what to expect and kind of what baselines you can use. Uh, and as Brandon mentioned, um, we're eager for anybody who is, um, in, who is interested in applying this to their own project, to starting a group of people who will simply discuss what they're doing and, and work together to do things like developing shared estimates on uh, important things. Um, so, actually, you can let us know in the chat right now if you know you're interested um, in joining a, um, a potential group, maybe like a monthly phone call um, about this, or you can email Brandon at floridadeftechnologycenter.org. So, one question's come up. Um, what are the like common estimates or guesses that you think really need a good guess so that we can compare things across projects? Ah, thank you. Um, I would say that the ones that I would most like to really understand more of are, so when we think about, so there's so many projects are about reading information. Um, or about taking action after somebody has done things, that thinking through um, how many people who uh, go to a page actually understand the page, how many people who understand the page actually take action, uh, how many people who 
create a form, document assembled, actually file the form. Um, so things that are, I think, pretty tangible to be able to say, all right, people are taking just kind of one step beyond what we can easily measure. How do we guess or do research to, um, to get to that in the community? Awesome. Other questions? Other thoughts? Um, if, if you were going to apply something like this um, to an online intake, uh, model in some way uh, to kind of see how many people are actually finding the services that might be uh, eligible and then what are some of the other things that um, you would really want to know in order to look at this because online intake is one of the most popular areas for um, grants and tries to speed up the access for individuals yep yep absolutely so I think the number targeted and the able to use it piece are straightforward. So number targeted is the number of people that you feel. So actually, it gets interesting. It's how many people, it's possibly, how many people would you, do you think would be eligible for your services? Or it's, some, it's that plus people who might wonder whether they're eligible for your services. Actually, it's probably both of those together, I might suspect. So especially if it has a triage element. Um, so you, you want to think through that. So who are you actually targeting? Are you targeting only people who are eligible or are you targeting kind of a larger population to help people understand that? Then able to use it is going to be very similar to other things that we've talked about. You'd want to think through who can actually get online, who can read it, who can um, speak the language. Um, found it would be a straightforward one. That's how many actually hit the top of the intake um, so that they've come to the intake. Received benefits is where things get really interesting here. So yeah, you might have a couple that are really important. Um, so logically, number of intakes um, is going to be an important benefit. So the number of people who actually um, uh, were referred for phone intake. But you may also have people, you know, like the people who made it all the way through uh, some kind of triage, but were referred to somebody else or some other information. That could also be an important benefit. You know, those are people who fundamentally are not calling the line um, and thus are saving up, saving, you know, uh, hotline staff to do something else. Um, so that might be another um, important benefit. Um, and then the positive outcome. So if you're thinking of people's lives, um, then you'd ideally want to be looking at, all right, and what kind of service did those folks Received? Did they were they more or less likely to receive service um, than the folks who uh, did not go through the online intake? Uh, were they more or less likely to get a whatever your organization defines as a kind of a good outcome? If you're measuring that, um, we actually just I I also um, uh, just finished up a project with Illinois with Vallejo. Um, and there's a report, I think it's released, or it will be released soon, that looked at the whole Aleo, um, um, uh, so it was specifically the Aleo uh, online intake and triage process, which actually did look at um, benefits and outcomes down at the end. Fantastic. Other questions? Um, that's all that we've got at this point. Uh, thank you so much for putting this on. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, the chat channel does have a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, this should be up within the next few days. Um, we will also have a link to um, all of the um, resources that are available over at Florida. Um, I am redistributing that link here. It's at the Florida Justice Technology Center.org slash Drake. Um, but that URL is also there available in the chat to the entire audience. Um, there is a lot more detail and in-depth stuff there, so I definitely recommend checking it out. 
Uh, we should have a, we'll have a follow-up survey, and uh, also the webinar survey is in there. So if there's topics, including this, that you want to see more on, please put that into the webinar survey. We're choosing our webinars for the rest of the year here in the next few days. Thanks. Thank you so much, guys. I'll see you soon.